Hello everybody, Bob6983 here, and we are back for some more Dragon Quest XI Echoes of Vanillas of Age. In the last episode, um, we completed the, uh, I guess, the entire game. That's basically it. That's all I can realistically say. We, uh, defeated a Kalasmos. Um, I still kind of feel a bit weird about doing it like that, but we did it regardless. Um, and in this episode... We are not in our normal save file. I am on my save file. The one with, at this point in time, 201 hours. Or maybe 202. Regardless, um, yes, that is where we are now. In this episode, we are going to be talking about um, super bosses and some, uh, I guess, outfits that we can specifically get only in the post game. And, um, all right. So, now that I'm, I guess, now that I'm good to go, all right. Let's go ahead and I guess jump right in. So we're going to go over to uh, Tickington. That is the very first thing that we're going to go ahead and do. Go ahead and go do, I should say. And I guess I'm going to show you probably maybe at best pictures. So heavy spoiler warning, I guess, for if you don't want to be spoiled for like what the super bosses look like. I may not go into Tickington. Just, eh, you know what? Screw it. I'll go in there. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about super bosses. We're going to be talking about all the outfits, um, be it ones that I do not have or the ones that I have, but you know, you only get in the post game items that you only get after you're done completing, um, everything or all the super bosses. And yeah, so I guess let's just go ahead and show off the very first thing, which is once you are done, um, with all of the tomes in the, um, I don't remember what this place is called, the echo chamber, I believe. You get a statue of all of the heroes of their time. I believe we only got this one for Dragon Quest uh, 9. But here is Dragon Quest 1, uh, Erdrick. Dragon Quest 2, another Erdrick, I believe. And Dragon Quest 3, the most, um, I guess, recognizable or memorable Erdrick that you probably have seen. The one in Smash Bros. as well. Um, this is Dragon Quest 4. Um, his name is Solo. Um, he has like a green outfit. He is the first of... Or I, okay, so here's going to be a lot of explanation about like timelines and stuff. So, this is the first hero who starts the Zenithian area of Dragon Quest. At, because all of these games are usually separated into um, sort of like timelines. These are like the Erdrick trilogies, because all of them are named Erdrick. These three are the Zenithian, um, I guess, Dragon Quest games. Um... And I guess before I continue any further, we're going to talk about a, also a bit more about how these games kind of go story-wise, or I guess which ones happen chronologically. So, this one released first, and then this one came afterwards, and then this one released third. However, Dragon Quest III's Erdrick, his story happens before the very first Ur Erdrick. So, the timeline goes, our, um, Dragon Quest XI, you know, our story, then Dragon Quest III... Then Dragon Quest 1, then Dragon Quest 2. So I know it's a bit confusing. I have no idea why that is. I cannot give you like a more in-depth explanation, but that is how it works. Now, the Zenithian games, they kind of go in the same similar fashion. Dragon Quest 4 happens, Dragon Quest 5 happens. Um, I don't remember what this character's name is, but if you want to base it off of the Netflix version, this character's name is Luca after the character or the, the player who was playing as, you know, their their character who named themselves Luca. So Solo, quote unquote Luca, and I do not know this <laughs> protagonist's name, but this is um, Dragon Quest VI. However, this follows the same fashion. This game happens first chronologically because they all have, I believe, they all have one similar location um, across all three games. However, these two have that location up in the sky, and this one still has it very much on the ground. So, you would assume chronologically, this one happened first, and then it got lifted up into the sky, and then these two games happened. So that is how that works chronologically. And then I have no idea about these games, honestly. Um, I believe this one, this one, and this one are all tied together maybe somewhat. I'm not quite sure, but... Um, Dragon Quest VIII is on its own, sort of. Um, we don't really know if it's in the Zenithian or if it's in the Erdrick or if it's in, like, the um, its own separate area. I don't know. 
But all we know is that it's like its own separate thing. It's got its own separate time. It's very much uh, apart from all of them. However, nonetheless, they all share, you know, the same spells of Zap. Kazap and um, Zappo, all of those. Anyways, I'm getting very off uh, off topic. We're here to talk about super bosses. So, the very first super boss, if you want to, I guess, dip your toes into kind of understanding what a super boss is like, um, you would fight an enemy called Erdrick's Restless Armor. I do not know where exactly this is, I so I will read it off of um, a website. I will not say what website because usually sometimes wikis are like, oh no, we have the web, you have the information here available for you, but it's not available for you to like quote us or like say stuff from us. So I will keep it very vague. So, um, the place that you can find Urgic's Restless Armor is in the cave to Renderak. I believe that's what it's called. Let me go ahead and see if one of these three tomes tell you where that is. Here it is, cave leading to Renderak. This is where you would go to fight Urgic's Restless Armor. And Urgic's Restless Armor basically just looks like the Restless Armor enemy, but it has Urgic's entire outfit. So this guy right here, it has his entire outfit, and he's over here in this cave. That cave is incredibly, incredibly difficult to go through. Not in the sense that there's a lot of monsters, although there are, but in more in the sense that um, there's a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of, oh, we're going to send you back to the beginning. There's, there's a lot of like, oh, if you're not going the right way, we're going to send you back. It's a very long process. So I guess best good, good luck for you to do that. I don't know what else to tell you. There's a few other items that you can get from all these tomes. For example, like the Golden Claws. I don't remember where you get those. Um, there's a Tempest Shield as well that you can get only from these books. You cannot sell those items. I can show you them after we're out of here in 3D. That way I can show you what they look like. But um, yes, those are some only rewards that you can get from these tomes. Uh, let's see. What else? What else can we cover? So after you're done with all of these tomes, after you're done, um, I guess, saving everybody and doing all the quests here, this area over here in the back will be opened up and they're all like, oh, some things are like uh, the the flow of nature or something. Something isn't all, something isn't good. You, can you go check it out over there? Like there's some tomes that opened up over there. You should help us out. So you go over here and the very first area that is open to you is the Hall of Remembrance. Over there will be your first three sets of super bosses that you need to fight. Um, and once you are... Once you are ready, you should maybe be about level 70, level 80, somewhere around there for like a comfortable level to be to fight these guys. Um, the very first three bosses that you will fight are... What is this guy's name? His name is Wormold Roth. There we go. It, it was very tricky to pronounce. So Wormoloth, W-Y-R-M-A-L-R-O-T-H, Lord Dragon, and Zomaiden. So Maiden looks like um, the Golden Girls or, you know, like the, the Iron Maidens. The ones that I'm always talking about. Oh, like this is my favorite, one of my favorite enemies in Dragon Quest, um, you know, design wise. Lord Dragon just kind of looks like the black dragon that was under the sewers of Heliodor. And Wormhole Roth kind of looks like the enemies that we steal the serpent souls from in the ruins of Dungersil. So once you have defeated them, um, one of them will drop an item called the Rainbow Drop. What that item does is essentially, I believe, 40% of the time that you are using spells or anything that um, consumes MP, it will not consume the MP that you're using. So, you would give this to a character like Veronica, Serena, the protagonist, or Silvano, or something like that. As they are, as they are the ones who are using the most MP. I personally have that item specifically set onto Veronica. If you want a little help on how to, I guess, go about defeating all of these enemies, I would say take out Zomaiden first, um, because I believe that one is the weakest of the three. Um, and also, I believe Zomaiden is one of the ones that heals up the entire party because they can heal up a lot of HP. Um, if you do not take out that um, that one first, I believe you'll have a problem when it comes to, I guess, oh, all my damage I did. Oh, look, it's all healed back. Now we have to start from scratch again. Um, I believe maybe Wormel Roth will do group attacks and Lord Dragon is the one that deals like a lot of 
specifically one attack strong damage output attack. I don't know how I'm saying it. Basically, Wormel Roth, I believe, is the one that does damage to the whole group. You should also worry about that one. Zomaiden is the one that um, kind of heals, but also does a lot of damage. And Lord Dragon is just, I guess, a nice middle ground. You would assume that one is the one that you're supposed to take out like first because it is the strongest attacker. But if you don't take out Zomaiden, then you have a problem with a healer. Anyways, now that we're done with that, I should also say, by the way, Lord Dragon is the one that drops the rainbow drop. And if you fail to defeat all three of them, then you have to do it all over again. Um, Before, I guess I close any other tabs because I, for I closed one on accident. Um... Wormel Roth, or whatever his name is, is the one who I believe destroyed the very first book. Um, I don't have the tome or the name of it on hand at the moment, but Lord Dragon is the one who um, kind of messed up the entire book for the Altar of Origins, the Dragon Quest II book. And Zell Maiden is the one who um, damaged the Altar of Salvation, which I believe is the Dragon Quest III book. Now that we're done with that, once you're done with um, defeating all of them, Hollow Remembrance Level 2 is opened up. And Hollow Remembrance Level 2 has another set of three bosses. So, the very first boss that you have to... Um, I mean, you fight them all, all at once again. But the very first boss that is, I guess, there in line because they're all there from left to right is Nimclops. He is the one who um, kind of messed up the hall or al the Altar of the Heavenly Bride. Um... Or, yeah, the Altar of the Heavenly Bride, my bad. Okay, yeah, he's the one who destroyed the one um, with... Um, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Um, All of the Heavenly Bride should be Dragon Quest V. And then we have... Uh, what is this guy's name? Sauroid. Sauroid is the one who destroyed... Or, I guess, messed up the Altar of the Chosen. I do not know what Dragon Quest that is. But then we have the last one, which is an enemy called Morta Mammoth. Surprisingly, is not a mammoth. It kind of looks like the Bill Halls that we fought, or I guess the Harmachis. That's kind of what he looks like. Saroid kind of looks like the um, the Iron Dragons that we um, fought in um, in uh, the Fortress of Fear, or whatever the upgraded version of that was, or like the Gold Dragons in uh, Guildenhall. My bad, I went to go turn off my heater because it was getting really hot in my room. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that is what Saroid looks like. And Nimclops just kind of looks like... Um, it's not a troll. I just... It's probably just a Cyclops from um, just any area. I don't know where exactly they haunt. I can't quite rip, put my finger on where. Um, I want to say target Saroid first because if I remember correctly, this one is the one that does group damage, but he does an attack... Kind of similar to Sylvandos have a ball where he will throw iron balls with spikes all over the field and it does a lot of damage. And he is, I believe, the biggest pain in the ass you could ever possibly imagine. Um, I don't know what else I can say for, um, for I guess, helping you out fighting them. Maybe also uh, target Mortar Mammoth as well because I believe Sarward and or Mortar Mammoth also heal the party as well. And Nimclops is, you know, just the powerhouse of the group. Um, I don't know what else they do. But, um, yeah, that, that's all I can say. So, what they drop isn't as cool. But what you get is an item called the War Drum. The War Drum, I believe, has the similar, if not the same effect as Oomph or Oomphal when used in battle. I do not know if it is an item that is, once you use it, it's done. But all I know is that that is the description in game. So that is all I can say um, for Nimclops, Saroid, and Mortar Mammoth. And then once you're done with them, you know, you go to Hollow Remembrance 3, or level 3, as you would. But this time it is not a uh, triple boss fight. This time it is a double boss fight against, and this this guy's name is going to be really hard to pronounce, Orgodolotl. Um, he basically looks like the Cactolotls or the Crystalotls, whatever you want to say. And he is responsible for um, messing up the Altar of the Forgotten Past. Which I believe is Dragon Quest 7? I'm not quite sure. Honestly, I, I have these 
in accordance to where exactly or how exactly they popped up i'm just assuming it's probably in chronological order but after seeing you know one of the super bosses that i saw previously was heavenly bright and that was the first one that popped up from left to right i'm like oh damn it's not following chronological order i may have to fix it in editing so yes there's orgotolotl and then there is hoopthorn and hoopthorn basically just looks like boogie booga whatever you want to call him i believe the japanese call him boogie um booga that's basically what he looks like he is the one responsible for destroying or rearranging the altar of the cursed king which is uh dragon quest 8 i this one i do know because that is um that is the game i guess i'm most familiar with aside from dragon quest 11. so uh these two will not have like a group of three or like a super boss ar arena of like three of them that you have to fight but do not let your guard down they are incredibly tough i believe orgotolotl is the one that you want to i guess the end goal that you want to take out i would not say specifically target him because um as much as he is the one that does like the extreme amount of damage and you should get out of the field first i believe hoopthorn just makes it almost impossible for you to do that so it's it's a mixture of taking out both of them at once but i'd say if you had to specifically choose one to take out first try to take out hoopthorn and then orgotolotl um, and they will um, specialize in doing a lot of status afflictions on you. This boss fight was really, really, really tough. Um, I had to do this maybe two, maybe three times. Um, but then once you're done with those two, you are not done yet. These guys, I don't believe... Oh, wait, never mind. I was going to say, I don't believe they drop items, but they do. So, because... And I guess spoilers for a little bit for Dragon Quest VIII as well. Um, because Hoopthorn is responsible for kind of destroying or messing around the you know the altar of the cursed king he also has the item and i believe this is maybe specific to um dragon quest 11 definitive edition only for this version i believe because 3ds version and the regular version does not have this item he drops the godbird scepter and if you don't know about the god the godbird scepter it is the staff that dual magus the main antagonist of dragon quest 8 uses so this is by far, bar none, the strongest um, heavy wand that you can use in the game. So if you want to give it to Rab, or if you want to give it to Veronica, this is bar this is bar none the best staff that you can have, or the heavy wand that you can have for those characters. And then after you're done fighting those two, um, immediately after you do not get time to um, heal or recover, you are immediately tossed into another dual super boss fight against Uncorvus, who is responsible for destroying the altar of the starry skies i do not know which one that is that might be dragon quest um nine i believe that yeah i think that that sounds about right either nine or seven and then alongside Uncorvus, there is an enemy called nogalas so Uncorvus looks like um the jerkules that we fought um and no, Galas kind of looks like those enemies. I don't know how else to describe these because we only saw them once. Um, I think they're called like clubbers or something like that. They're on the island with a bunch of brownies like south of the strand where the old man was like, oh, do, do the buff buff with, with Jade and the protagonist against one of these guys and then come back. I'll give you a Venus tier. That's that's what No Galas looks like. And he is responsible for um, messing around with the altar of the Undeciphered. Um, once you are done defeating those two, they are, they're basically just powerhouses, two powerhouses just in the, uh, super boss arena, I guess. They don't really specialize in, I guess, doing like hindrance stuff. I believe, I believe it's just Hoopthorn and Orgold Delottle who focus on that. And once you're done defeating these two, Nogalas will drop an item called the Crimson Katsu. You may have seen a peek of the outfit when I was in the overworld, but it is an outfit specific to Serena. It makes her hair very flowy, very wavy, and puts her in basically a skin tight, um, I want to say leather or red leather suit, something like that. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. But yes, it looks really nice on Serena. And once you are done with that, um, there is one more super boss that you can fight, and it is in the deepest recesses of the past. And that enemy is essentially 
And I guess spoilers one more time. I'm warning you all, I guess. That way nobody's like, oh no, you're you're putting spoilers out. I'm telling you all right now, like this 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 episode is heavily spoiler warning. Um it is essentially the antithesis to Kalasmos. This is the other half of Kalasmos, you know, like kind of like the yin and yang type um idea when it comes to this. Um Yeah, so where Kalasmos is like, you know, like a, just an evil entity just because he wants to. Um, this new enemy uh, super boss is called the End of Time. I believe that's what his name is. Um, looks exactly like Kalasmos. And he's like, oh, heroes, I'm going to destroy everything. You all best be prepared. Oh, here we go. And then, you know, he starts the boss fight. Once he starts the boss fight, he basically does the exact same stuff as um, Kalasmos. Uh, he can regain a lot of HP very quickly, very similar to his counterpart. Um, he can stop time as well. He basically is just Kalasmos, but just stronger. You should be about level 90, bare minimum, to fight him. Um, and then at the end of the boss fight, when you have done as much as you possibly can, and there's like a little cutscene, he's like, oh, shoot, you, like, you basically almost defeated me. But now I'm going to do a super incredibly almighty strong attack. My strongest attack. It will take you and me out with like, I'll take you all out with me. You know, oh, here we go. And everybody in the party is like, oh, my God. Like if, if he if we've been fighting him at our best now and he's saying he's going to do an all out attack. I don't think we can handle this. And he's like, all right, here we go. Three, two, one. And then he's like, OK, I'm just kidding. He turns back into a very small version of himself. Um... And he was like, ah, see, we, we, we do a little silly time. We, we, we were just joking. I'm, I'm sorry. See, the real thing is, my name is actually not the end of time. My name is the friend of time. Uh, see, I was the one who told all of those MFers to go and destroy or like rearrange the past. And the reason why I did this is because I wanted to test you, Luminary. It's because... I know that Kalasmos, I know my big brother, you know, I know that he is a, you know, a threat that you should, you know, we should be worried about. You should be, tra you know, you should be training yourself to be able to take him out. And he's like, yeah, I did all of this basically to train you up, to toughen you up. That way you had no problems fighting my other half. But surprisingly, the super boss fight against the end of time is like twice as hard as the actual boss fight against Kalasmos. If you fought Kalasmos, then... Yeah, uh, the end of time is like twice as hard. So uh, there's no reason, there's no reason that you should be able to fight um, the friend of time first. If you if you fight him first, then there's no reason that you should be worried about Kalasmos. It makes no sense for the super boss to be, you know, hey, you know, I was just prepping you for my big brother, you know, um, when in reality he's the one who's stronger than Kalasmos. I don't know. It makes no sense. Um, but once you have done that, uh, I don't believe they give you any more items. But then after you've done all that, there is a portal in the sky, butterfly in the sky, um, portal in the sky that opens up. Um, and it says like, oh, like there's like a giant portal, like of like, a, I don't know, like a rip in time above the skies of Erdria. And all the party is like, oh my god, this is like the strongest like thing of like darkness I've ever even conceived. Like Kalasmus had nothing on this guy. Like the the friend of time had nothing on this guy. Like this is bar none the strongest like I don't know like evil power I've ever even felt. And that is the last super boss I'm currently dealing with. I have not defeated him just yet. Um his name is the Time Worm, and it is essentially a reskin of the Mordigan boss fight in the first half of the game. Um, so yeah, that is basically what it is. And he's like, "Oh, you think I'm just gonna allow this to be the um, you know, the the, the the turn of events for the world of Erdria? You think I'm just gonna sit here?" And let you defeat Kalasmos? Oh, no, 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 no. The world of Rodria is meant to be, like, in all of, like, this turmoil, all this awful stuff. You think I'm just going to sit here and just allow this? No, no, we're fighting here. So you have a boss fight against him. I still have not done this just yet. But your reward for this is, if you remember uh, Boogie or Booga, whatever you want to call him, 
he gave Jay the hair raising suit. And that is your reward, I believe, for defeating the Time Worm or whatever his name is. And the um, the stats or the things that it gives you is, I believe, whenever I get whenever Jade is defeated, she will instantly revive no matter what. Um, charm goes up to two hundred, and d your your defense goes up by only by one. But you know, it basically just allows you to never die as Jade. Anyways. There's one more thing that I wanted to show you all that, or I guess one more thing that I wanted to talk about before I went ahead and showed you all, all the things that I got. Um, so there is a taco that I forgot to mention that I got off screen um, that I should probably tell you all what it is. So I don't know what exactly, what exactly, what altar it's from, but I believe it's called the Rainbow Rock Salt Mines or something like that. And the location where I got that was, let me go ahead and zoom over there. It is in Dundrasil. And I'll show you where exactly I found him. That way you all are not like, oh, where exactly did you get him, Bob? Like, well, what, what happened? Like, you, I need to know. That way you don't just give me like a vague idea of where it is. I'll show you exactly where I got him. It's just, there were a lot of cutscenes that happened here um, during like the events of the game. And like part one of the entire game. And I just, I guess I never went back to, I guess, go and get that taco. But yes, it is somewhere over here. I believe it is either, I believe he is either in here. It's, this is probably where he is. He was, I think he was like somewhere like standing here and like you talk to him and he was like, oh, hey, you see me. He's like, here, go to the rainbow rock salt mines. Here you go. Here's the password. It's either there or here, but I'm like 90% sure he was over here in this house. The ruined house, I guess. Um, right on the window seal. Yes, yeah, that is where you get that password for the rock salt mines. Every other password that I have missed, I'm going to say, unfortunately, you're going to have to find it on your own. Or you find that password via defeating or completing um, a quest inside of one of those tomes. So, yeah, best of luck doing that. And now, I guess, one more time, last time for spoilers... Here are the things that you get as your rewards. So, um, I did the last wheel of Harma. I have the brilliant blade. This is the best, um, great sword bar none for Hendrik. The stats are 356 for attack. Well, I mean, since I have it plus three, charm is a hundred. Parry chance, incre um, increased by 11%. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? I have the Uber Gring whip. If you want to see the stats on that 196. Um, increased attack and 40 charm and it does full damage whenever it attacks all the enemies so it, no more of that like oh whenever I, I attack multiple enemies on the field i'm only doing 100 then 90 then 60 or something like that no it does all the equal amount of damage as as it should um let's see what else do i have that i should show off um i have the fairy king's cane i believe you get this also from the last wheel of harma it deals all, all damage taken reduced by 10%, 25 HP restored each turn. Your attack increases by 94. Magical Might increases by 20. Magical Mending increases by 75. And MP absorbed whenever you're attacking regularly is increased by 8%. And this is what the Crimson Cat Suit looks like. It looks really, really, really nice on Serena. Quite frankly, I don't know why she doesn't do this with her hair more often. It looks really, really nice. But look at them, look at them boots, bro. They look really, really nice on Serena. My apologies, girl, but like I, I really did want to show off the boots. They they suit you really well. Anyways, um I don't know if I have anything else I wanted to show. Uh, because I have I have basically every outfit except for the hair raising suit. Um I did want to show off the the, the rainbow drop. And the Godward Scepter. As you can see, the Godward Scepter, this is exactly what it looks like. Very similar to what it looks like in Dragon Quest VIII. Uh, wielded by Dual Magus, you know. Um, and you can use it as an item in battle. 30% chance of preventing the enemy from casting spells when attacking. And unleashes the devastating power of darkness on a single enemy when used as an item in battle. Your attack increases by 112. Your magical might increases by 120. I'm almost at 999 for my um, <laughs> special attack stat, I guess. Or for my magical might stat. Magical Mending is increased by 50. MP Absorption is increased by 16. And 
The description for this says, This sacred rod can stop enemies from using spells and is imbued with the spirit of an incredibly evil entity. So you best believe only the most strongest and most, I guess, skilled mages can wield this. The last time that somebody wielded this in Dragon Quest VIII, you know, they got kind of possessed by, you know, an evil entity. They could not handle it. And they became the main antagonist of a game. So... I think at least Veronica can handle it as she is, you know, now level 99. And also, I guess last time I should probably talk about this, the rainbow drop. Again, like I said, 40% chance of the spells and abilities consuming no MP. Magical Might increases by 22. Magical Might increases by 23. And Charm increases by 35. I heavily debated on whether who, whether I should put this on Serena because she's always healing. Or Veronica. But I was like, screw it. Veronica needs to be doing her offensive spells at all times. I think, you know, that is that is what we should be doing with her. But, yeah, that is realistically it for this episode, I should say. Unless you all want to see me fight the Time Worm. But I am still very, very, very much not comfortable with how um, how to do it. I could maybe show you all, like, the cutscene. But I don't know, man. I really don't know. It's... It's a really tough boss fight, and quite frankly, I don't know if I really want to do this. But, here, I guess, to show you all, um, before I, um, maybe end the episode, um, I have all of these skills for all of the characters, in case I ever want to change them. There's only, like, maybe three characters that I don't have it for, which is Serena, but the only thing I don't have for her is Counterweight, which is a spell, or a thing specifically for Spears. Um... So Vondo, I don't have Miracle Slash. Um, for Jade, I have everything. For Rap, I have everything. And Hendrik, I'm also missing Miracle Slash. But realistically, you're not really missing out if you don't get everything. You do get an achievement for specifically um, getting or completing all of the skill tree. But after like level 97, your party basically just stops getting skill points. Even if you get to level 99, your your stats increase, but you stop getting skill points for a good portion of your cast. So the only way to get skill seeds reliably is a setup where you have Eric having the Pirate King's Pendant, a Bunny's Tail plus three, Veronica having one of the um, mini metal outfits on her, having um, Bunny Tail plus threes on her as well, two of them to be exact. Jade having that exact same setup and Serena having that exact same setup and being here in the Dungeon region going over to the campsite asking the cow hey you know uh, what what's the weather going to be like waiting for it to be um, raining and then once it's raining there's going to be an enemy that pops up I believe here let me see if I can point out where exactly he pops up I believe here maybe somewhere here I'm not quite sure maybe here so it's right where I was, I believe. Uh, maybe here? So it's this area, more or less, is where he pops up. And then there is, I believe, two more that pop up. Not here. So there should be one that pops up here. And then I think maybe one more. Somewhere in between there. I don't know. They, they just freaking fall out of the sky quite frankly i don't know what to call them i believe they're like the great keeper statues or the malicious great keeper statues let me see if i can find them but yes they have a rare chance of dropping seeds of skill that is basically your quickest way to get that and basically just defeat them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until you get as many seeds of skill that you want and of course itemized skill man get your ugly out of here bruh uh, um, itemized kill, and he's moving me. Itemized kill and hallelujah will be your bar none best way to get those seeds of skill. Um, let me see in nearby monsters. Let me see if I can find specifically what his name is. The Malicious Great Keeper. This is the one that jumps out of the sky. He jumps Saint Soma and seeds of skill. As you can tell, the seeds of skill is the rare item. Um, but yeah, that is how you get all of your, um, your character builder all the way up if you're missing a few um, skill points for your characters. But aside from that, there is nothing more I can show you. 
All right, real quick, because I ended the episode off a little too early, and I, I did this. Um, I'm doing this like after I finished the recording. Um, few things that I need that I need to cover really quickly before things are done. Number one, every time that you log back into your save file that you have completed, um, it will take you back to the last point in time that you've saved. Despite it saving after you've completed everything, um, it will still give you back the Super Sword of Light. I believe, at least, and you will still be able to fight uh, Kalasmos. And it'll be like, oh yeah, once you're ready, go up there. And it's like, oh wait, didn't I just do that? It basically just puts you back into a, a point in time where you can continue to play the game uh, whenever you want, if you want to complete more things to be able to fight super bosses, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, that is how you're able to go fight super bosses. And you're like, oh wait, I just defeated Kalasmos. What do you mean I can go back and fight super bosses? Yeah, it puts you back into a point in time where you have not fought Kalasmos just yet. Do not worry. Kalasmos will always be there, um, and whenever you want to go defeat it and complete the game, you can always go do that. So, that is how that works. Kalasmos will never um, go down and destroy Erdria. It will always just wait for you to complete it, and that is it. Um, that is number one. Number two, I kind of glossed over um, everything um, regarding um, the Erdric trilogy and then um, the Zenithian trilogy. Uh, I guess somewhat... Um, fan theory kind of but like this is the only way that we can kind of connect the dots between all the dragon quests um so this is how it kind of goes so i guess spoilers i guess for uh dragon quest one through one through six i think because that is basically how we're going to be um connecting the games um so again dragon quest 11 happens first dragon quest 3 happens next then dragon quest 1 and 2 um the sword that they all use, despite it not kind of looking like that in the game, is still the Super Sword of Light. They all use the Super Sword of Light. Um, but the Zenithian sword in the Zenithian games being Dragon Quest VI happening first, and Dragon Quest IV, and Dragon Quest V, it does not look like um, the Supreme or the Super Sword of Light. However, um, the hilt heavily, and I mean heavily, the hilt heavily looks like the Zenithian sword. Um, the very top part of the sword as well also has like the um, the cut into the sword and then it goes out into like a triangle shape. So that um, uh, kind of makes it so it's like, oh wait, but if this is based off of the Supreme Sword of Light and the, the Urgic Trilogy has the Super Sword of Light, then where does this all connect Dragon Quest Eleven And the kind of fan theory that goes around the internet that you know is suggested to be like the best thing that we have so far to connect all the games is um in this game dragon quest 11 we supposedly make two different timelines the timeline where we um where we fought and defeated mortigan as the main antagonist where you know our um our, our sort of light that we crafted was destroyed um, we left the sword destroyed over there in that timeline, but since there is no super sword of light, since we took it with us, um, and it was destroyed in our timeline, you know, because it was Mordigan's sword, and it was a sword regardless, that timeline was left with no super sword of light to defend against the evil. So, as time went on, that sword uh, was rusted, and it became the Zenithian sword. Um, that is how the, that theory goes, because, as you know, the Sword of Light was destroyed, and all that was left was kind of like the tip of it and like the hilt, and everything else of the sword was kind of damaged. So it was repurposed into the Zenithian sword. That is why it looks so similar, uh, hilt wise, from the very bottom, where it has like the, the red circle and like the little, like, I don't know, maybe smiley face smile at the very bottom of it. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. Here, let me see if I can show you really quickly. Um, here, this. That little thing, um, at the like there, there, that, that that thing. That's why it looks so similar to the Zenithian sword. Um, and in this timeline where we still have the super sword of light, it looks like this, right? And as you can see, there's no little like um, tip that looks like a triangle thing, like that. The Zenithian sword heavily looks like the supreme sword of light. That is why they're like, oh, well, that timeline was left with no super sword of light or supreme sword of light to defend against evil. So it turned into the Zenithian sword. And then in this timeline, this is where we go into the Erdrich trilogy. We still have the super sword of light to defend against all evil. Um, and yeah, 
that is why the Urchic trilogy is like its own thing and the Zenithian trilogy is like its own separate thing. It does not happen on the same timelines. And then there's Dragon Quest VIII. It's like it's oddball. We have no idea about that. Anyways, that is all I wanted to say. No more stalling. We have basically gotten to like the 40 minute mark talking about um, Dragon Quest lore and the timeline. Anyways, uh, goodbye. I have done everything that I could possibly show you all for Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age. I believe I have all the outfits that's good for the hair razor. And yes, I have the, um, what is it? I have the cat outfit for Veronica. I did spend money on it. I'm just going to go through all of these outfits really quickly to show you all that. I've done my best to show you everything that I possibly can for this game. There really is nothing more that I can show you. I said I was not going to be thorough when it came to this game because like I was not a, I guess, I was not a professional or I was not the person to go to when it came to this game. But oh my god, I did my research as much as I could. <laughs> I did not think I was going to be doing this much research. I, I learned a lot about this game, but yeah, there realistically is nothing else I can show you. The Lupin look, the Stone Cold Killer, the Prickly Pirate King, the Pirate King, the Swindler, the Spiky Swindler, the Swindler King. You know, you, you get the idea. There, there really is nothing more I can show you. Um, but yeah, we're, we're done with Dragon Quest. Next time on the channel, we are basically going to be, I don't know, new series, I guess. But no more Dragon Quest for now. This is the last outfit that you can get um, for a wrap. It is called the Sun King. Um, not One Piece, though. But uh, or the Sun God, my bad, not the Sun King. There is a Sun King, but this is the Sun God. Now, you get this from the last Wheel of Harma, I believe. But yeah, that is all. Before I say thank you all so much for watching, I'm going to look at one more item that I didn't go into detail on. Grandmaster Peng's favorite disciplinary device misses a lot, but when it hits, it hurts. This thing has a high chance of missing, but whenever it hits, I believe it always crits bars. Hold the fuck up. Anyways, um, thank you all so much for watching. Um, next time, we will, I, I don't know. We're, we'll we'll be done with Dragon Quest. Um, and I guess we'll start a new ep series on the channel. I don't know when. But yeah, that, that's it. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, and yeah, I guess I will see you all then. Wait, before we go, before we go, before we go. No, 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 not that, not that, not that. Before we go. I guess. That's, uh, I don't know. Let's reposition everybody. Look this way, please. Yeah, let's do, I don't know, Hocus Pocus. And there we go. All right, so until next time, see you all then for, I guess, a new series on the channel.